getting ready to enter into the month of Adar. It starts Thursday, February 11th at sundown. Why is that important? It's because it's the 12th month on the Hebrew calendar. If you count the religious calendar, which starts at Passover. So Passover in 2020 takes us all the way to this 12th month of Adar. And Adar is a very special month, not only because it's the 12th month on the religious calendar, it is only the sixth month on the uh, civil calendar, which starts at Rosh Hashanah. And that's how God works it. He actually has four New Year's. We focus on two when we talk about timing. So when we talk about being sensitive to times and seasons of the Lord, it's important to understand that the month of Adar is the month in which the Lord says things are completed, and so therefore I want to release my joy. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that makes me pretty happy. Lord, going to release the joy, and there's the fullness of joy in his presence. We know this to be true, right? When we're in his presence, we feel the joy of the Lord. We feel that deep and abiding connection with him. We feel how much joy emanates from him. And so this is a month of celebration because it's the last month of uh, the um, religious calendar year. It's also the month where uh, the Israelites uh, remembered that they were, um, were in Egypt and they were getting ready to go over into the promised land. That's what Passover is all about. And we'll be celebrating that in Nisan when we come t- uh, in the middle of, of uh, it's actually near the end of March, the beginning of April this year is Passover. But it's the time where we understand that, that we're stepping into the, the total fullness of the completion, okay? So this is the completed month, and then the Passover is begins uh, the new things that are coming, all right? So, so when we think about Adar, we think about the fact that we've stepped into completion, we've stepped into fullness, we've stepped into the fact that God says, I want you to walk in my joy, I want you to stand a- in my place of peace, I want you to remember, and we're going to talk about, uh, today we're going to talk about Purim, which is actually two days on the calendar at the end of the month that are representative. The the Jews associate with that that as a time of being released from the uh, evil plot that Haman had against the Jewish people. And so it's a time of victory. So this is a month that is filled with uh, the joys of victory as well. And I'm going to share with you about Queen Esther here today. But I want you to kind of understand the fact that this last month is a time where the Lord wants us to focus on his joy. Now, let me just talk to you a little bit prophetically, uh, kind of what's happening in the atmosphere right now. Anybody been going through some spiritual warfare the last week to 10 days? Anybody? Mm-hmm. Like aggravating things. You've had like an aggravation. Or all of a sudden you've got all kinds of like weird things that are happening around you that are out of order. They're not orderly, and they represent a level of chaos. And you're thinking to yourself, no, wait a minute. Things don't normally go like this. Why is this chaotic? And any time that there's chaos or things are out of order, it invites forces to come in and kind of mess with us. Well, why would now be a time for spiritual warfare? As, As the calendar is getting ready to turn over here into this new month of Adar, because this is actually a time of promotion, there's multiple times on the calendar where God has promotionary periods. And, and they are after a time of purification and consecration, which we just went through that in January when we fasted and prayed for 21 days. We set ourselves apart. And so the next step is that God brings about promotion. Well, it wasn't just our church that entered into that place of praying and fasting and giving. There are churches all over the world that set themselves apart in the month of January. And so the Lord honors that. And so what he does is he begins to start shifting things in our lives because everything that God does is sip, cyclical. There's a, there's a big circuit that, he, that he's on. And so when you assess times and seasons, you know that everything will always come back 
to the place that it first started. And so every year is like that. It just kind of rotates like that. And God does certain things on the calendar at certain times. This is why it's important to know and understand God's prophetic calendar, which is his Hebrew calendar, which is why we emphasize it so much here at Freedom Destiny. So we want you guys to be able to see prophetically. We want you to see and understand what God is doing so you can meet him there. So technically, the reason for the spiritual warfare is because promotion has happened in your life. Why were you promoted? Because you passed through a phase of purification and consecration, and God has set you apart for this Gregorian calendar year of 2021. And so with that comes friction from the enemy. Friction from the enemy is always proof that we've been promoted. Anytime you've been promoted, the devil will always come to push back. He will come to kill, steal, and destroy. He will come to rob you of the new place that God is taking you. He's such a liar because he can't really do any of that. It's all an illusion. He can't ever take from you what God is, has given you and what God has assigned for you to have. But he can cause you to doubt and fear and be anxious and question. And so as we were coming into Adar, I want you to know something. You need to know that you've been promoted. And there is joy that comes with this promotion if you know how to walk in the power, the peace, the revelation of heaven as you step into the spheres of influence that God has given you. See, no one can take from you, but aggravation can come and cause you to feel like you're off of your, off of your strong foundation that you came to build. And so today I want to talk to you about Queen Esther and how she was promoted twice. She was promoted twice, and I want to show you this because this actually shows you cyclical things, you know, different times and seasons. But what her second promotion actually meant, because I want you to be challenged today to think about the fact that God has indeed promoted you, but your promotion may actually look way different than you imagined it would look. So I want you to kind of get your eyes on straight here. And so we know from the, from the uh, book of Esther, the story here of Mordecai, who was the cousin of Esther, whose real name was Hadassah. She was a Jewish girl, and she was raised in the house of her cousin Mord Mordecai. And there came a time where the king, King Xerxes, decided to outcast his rebellious wife, Vashti, and was looking for a new bride. Well, she had come into the house of the king, which was her first promotion. With her first promotion, she had to go through a time of purification, time of royal treatments. It was like a year before she ever saw the king that she was being prepared to meet him and to be with him. Okay, that was her first step of promotion, coming from the house of Mordecai and going in to the king's house. Yet, she was coming into the king's house with the identity of being a young Jewish woman in his, uh, in his castle. And there, he was not aware that she was Jewish, okay, nor was anybody else. So she had hidden identity, okay? She had hid the identity of who she was at the instruction of Mordecai to come in. Well, she's there. She, she goes through her treatments, all of that. She meets the king. And... Of course, her and the king start developing relationship, right? Well, later it comes that Mordecai, her cousin, sends a message to her. Because Mordecai is actually, if you, we read the whole book of Esther, he's very, very um, uh, sly. He hangs around the doors of the, the castle on a frequent basis to hear the grumblings of those that are outside, to kind of grab a hold of what's taking place in the kingdom, he wants to get a good ear to that so that he's able to come up with different ways that he can protect his people. And so he gets word through some grumblings that Haman, who was appointed by the king, uh, Haman was, was angry because Mordecai saw him as a fraud, and there was an edict that was sent out where everyone had to bow down to Haman every time he was around, and Mordecai was like, no, I'm not going to do that. This guy's a fraud, okay? And so he stood for what he believed to be true. Well, Haman just kept getting angrier and angrier because he wasn't getting the respect 
And so he casts lots, and that's what the word Purim means, okay, is a casting of lot. He casts lots to come up with a day where he could destroy the Jewish people. And so he, spe- he, he ended up um, casting these lots for, which is what they call Purim, which for us is going to be the end of February, okay? It's actually February 25th uh, through the 26th. And it's a celebratory time in Israel. They dress up in costumes. They have parties. It's a great time of celebration and joy. Why? Because God protected the Jewish people from annihilation by Haman, who had cast lots on a day to destroy them. God had, had stepped in and caused him to be hung because of the obedience of Esther. Okay, now let me tell you what Esther actually did, all right? So here she is. She's in the king's courts. And Mordecai, in order to uh, provide her with information, uh, speaks to a eunuch and says, listen, I need you to go and tell Esther this very thing. And I'm going to read it to you in Scripture because it's very, very vital for you for the promotion that God has given you. Esther chapter 4, verse 13 and 14 reads, So Mordecai sent this reply to Esther because he told her, listen, this guy Haman's up to bad news and you're going to need to step in here and you're going to need to go to the king. And and she comes back actually and she's telling him, listen, I haven't seen the king for 30 days. I I don't know if this guy wants to see me. I mean, like, you know, he, he and I really haven't had a relationship for 30 days here. And Mordecai comes back to Esther and says this, Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this? Promotion number two. Now, come on, this doesn't look like, you know, I'm going to sit all royal in the castle and wait for somebody to feed me. What? You're telling me that I've come for such a time as this? This is my promotion? That, that, that me and my people might possibly die? Like, this is too much weight. Guess what? She just became queen. What I mean by that is the queen can wear a crown, but she ain't no queen until she's standing to save her nation. Come on. And every queen from the beginning of time will tell you that she's had to stand for her nation at some point. Otherwise, she is not the true mother of the nation. Same thing goes for the father of the nations. A father is not a true father unless he must stand for his children. So now's her moment. All the royal treatments, all of this. And now she's faced with her promotion. Ooh. Come on, that alone, we could just end right there. We could end right there, break up into small groups. Talk about how each one of us had been promoted and our, and our promotion was our death day, right? Jesus got promoted and he died. Buried, resurrected. And then got promoted again when he ascended. Promotion hurts. Promotion means you got to stand and open up your mouth and tell somebody, be bold. This is who I am. This is what I'm called to do. This is what the Lord is asking of me. Listen, promotion isn't just about your royal crown and your royal treatments and all your royal banquets. When it comes down to it, it's about the rough of life and getting into it. Now, Esther was scared. She was so scared, and this is what she said. She sends this reply to Mordecai in verse 15. She says, go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything that Esther had ordered him. Promotion. 
especially in 2021. So she said, Mordecai, go tell everyone in the kingdom to fast for me because I'm the one that's got to stand for our nation. I've got to go forward, and I've got to make the proclamation to the king, who, by the way, hadn't seen me for 30 days, which means I wasn't trying to give him some, you know, hoochie-coochie, hoping he's going to love me all that much more, and that he's going to agree to what I'm telling him. Come on, let's be serious. Come on. Come on. There ain't no woman on the planet that hadn't thought of that strategy. Let's just get real. Come on, you're just stupid if you don't think like that. I'll just tell you. You're not trying to be manipulative. You're just dumb. (laughs) (laughs) There are reasons that God puts men and women together. Because when your man is headstrong and steadfast and he's unmovable, he may need some help. Come on. He may just need a little bit of help. So God has given him a help, mate. There's an Eve for every atom. In this case, there's a Candace for an atom. But you know what I'm talking about here. I'm just talking for real. Come on. Listen, the, uh, the book, the, the, our great Bible, got a whole lot of stories about this truth. Okay? But here she was. No availability to use any of her other means. Because she hadn't even seen him. And by the way, the king didn't even really know who he was sleeping with. Because she was Jewish. Come on, let's get real. He did not even know who she was. So she's got to come forth and do this, but she asked for prayer, fasting. She asked the people of the kingdom because she knows there's not going to be any more kingdom if they don't all gather together and do what? Pray for her because she's got to come forth and do this. Now, what does this have to do with your promotion? Some of you need some friends, some spiritual friends. I'm not talking about your honky-tonk friends. I'm talking about some real friends, right? I'm talking about the ones that are going to pray with you, they're going to fast with you, they're going to give for you, they're going to stand with you. Come on. You need some of those kind of friends, right? Them other friends, they're a dime a dozen, and they're waiting for you to quit your spiritual thing and get on board with them. So she was crying out to the kingdom for anybody that was going to lay down their life with her because you all know fasting's no fun. Come on, fasting and fun are not in the same category. That's affliction to your soul. That's a free will choice to not eat. So she goes and asks him that. So what does this have to do with you? You need some friends. You need to be gathered together in your small groups. You need to be coming to intercessory prayer. Come on, a plug for intercessory prayer. You need to be praying together. You need to be praying not only for yourself, for your family, for your sphere of influence, but also for your nation. Come on. See, we need to come together to do that. So for her great promotion of death, she called the kingdom to pray and fast for her. Well... It was successful as she went before the king. And she was afraid because unless she got the golden scepter, she was not going to get the the right to, to talk with him about this. But she got the golden scepter extended to her, and she went forth. Now, here's the deal about promotion. When God takes you to the next level of promotion, you're going to a place that you've never seen, imagined, or touched before. You've got an idea, but there's a whole other level to it. There's a whole other level. It assimilates some with your current place, but it looks totally different. 
And God wants to use you in a mighty way in this new place. Now, why is it that God will promote us, but somehow or another leave us in a place of fog where we're not entirely sure how we're going to navigate this new promotion? Because he's a good dad, and he don't want you to be promoted without him. So he's like, if I'm going to promote you, I want to make sure that we do this thing together. So I'm not going to give you the whole story. I'm just going to teach you how to pray and fast and be obedient and to rest in me as I empower you for this new place that I'm taking you. And so that brings me now to the important place of how we must see ourselves if we're to respond like she responded, if, if we're to position ourselves properly to be able to carry out our new promotion. Now, she was in the royal palace. Now, this is very prophetic, okay? You want prophetic? This is prophetic. The woman that comes to save the nation is in the palace to save the nation. So that means her position was such that she was seated in a place of power, whether or not the king recognized it or not, okay, because he had to be the one that granted her that place of power, all right? The people recognized it because they listened to what she said and they fasted because it ended up being very successful and the Jews were not annihilated, which is why there's a celebration in the month of Adar called Purim. But what this means for us is you can't be thinking that you're on the rough side of nowhere if you plan on being in a state of promotion. You've got to see yourself in the palace in order to carry out what it is that God has called you to do. See, God can promote you, but if you're still looking like a peasant or thinking like a peasant or realizing that you're not really seated with Christ in heavenly places, the effect that you have will not be as grand as it would be if you knew exactly where God had seated you. So when God says, I'm promoting my people, He's saying, listen, you got to stop thinking that you're still in Egypt. you got to start thinking that you're in the promised land. you got to stop thinking that you live in this place and start thinking about the fact that you live in this place. Because here's the deal. When you're promoted, you're promoted to save the environment that God's called you to be in. And how are you going to save the environment that God's called you to be in if you're still a part of that environment? In your head. And in your body, you're no good. See, when he says it's time for promotion, he's saying, I want you to know you're seated with me in heavenly places before you begin to activate this promotion that I've given you. Otherwise, you're going to look just like you did yesterday, and nobody's going to listen to you. Every change that is made in the earth is first made in the mind. Mind is extremely powerful. It's powerful because it's the seat of, that God has given us in order to access the heavenlies. You access the heavenlies through your soul and through your spirit. Your spirit is brand new. It's alive. Your soul's being being taken to the place of transformation. It's being transformed night and day into the person who lives in the palace. Not the person that lives in the backside of the desert. That's not what God's renewing your mind to. He pulled us out of that. That's why Adar is so important, the month of Adar. Why? It was the last month they spent in Egypt before they went to the promised land. Hallelujah. So what God's saying to you is, this is the last time you're going to be who you think you are in this place because I've now promoted you, so now you've got to start seeing yourself as who I've called you to be and begin to start moving in it. This is your last time. This is it. And so you need to make sure that you understand where your citizenship lies. Your citizenship lies in heaven. No, I know you think you're a citizen of the United States of America. Or you think you're a citizen of the earth. Well, I'm going to encourage you today to renounce your earthly citizenship and put on your heavenly citizenship. You just need to renounce your earthly citizenship. Do you understand what I'm saying? You need to renounce your earthly citizenship. I don't even want to tell you that you're a dual citizen and you've got dual citizenship in both places. I'm telling you, renounce your earth citizenship and take partake of your heavenly citizenship that he has given you. 
Because that is going to be the only thing that carries you into this new place that God is taking you. And listen, I'm speaking prophetically. Church, Church of Jesus Christ, he's taking us all into a new place. It's a true fact. Like we're all going to a new place. And I'm not talking about when you die. I'm talking about the fact that he's moving his church to an understanding, a revelation, a grabbing hold of who we really are so that we can walk in this power that we've all been talking about walking in. It's time to start shifting. You've been promoted individually, but we've been promoted as a body. And he's already given us everything we need to make the difference. That means that we have to live in this earth as though we are seated there as a citizen of heaven. Now, the Apostle Paul went through way more than you or I have ever been through. Yet that man spoke with the greatest sense of rejoicing with the greatest sense and understanding that while he's in chain, while he's in prison, while he's going through all of this, not to mention the guilt and condemnation that he carried by killing what later was his brothers and sisters, but that he didn't even know that. All of that, and this man talks about his citizenship in heaven all the time. You do not hear him talking about anything but to renounce what's happening in the earth and to step into that new place. That place of promotion. In Philippians chapter 1, verse uh, 27, the Apostle Paul says this to the church at Philippi. Above all, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or I only hear about you, this is how trapped he was. I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Hallelujah is right. That is the word of the Lord. Now, the Apostle Paul's words are the word of God spoken to us. This is what God says to us. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or I only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. We must do this. We must do this. We must decide that we're going to live in the palace as citizens of heaven, giving our lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm speaking more now than ever, give your life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give your life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give your life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not about your initial salvation. That's not just giving your life to the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. We give our life after we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior to go forth and to be his hands and feet, to be his voice, to carry the word. You are carriers of the word of God. Everywhere you go, you carry the word, and then God gives you an opportunity to make that deposit. And that deposit is a heavenly deposit because the word is heavenly. The word that was written is heavenly first, came into the earth. So, that's our power source for promotion. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 20. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. And they think only about this life here on earth. Ooh. Listen, God loved the earth so much that he did what? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to shed his blood to redeem the earth. But we are not to love the earth more than we love him who gives us the power to subdue and rule the earth. We had our priorities out of whack. 
Verse 20, but we are citizens of heaven. Again, the trapped man says this to the people. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, that's where what being a citizen of heaven is. That's where Jesus lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. True statement. It was true for them 2,000 years ago. It's true for us. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Amen. So, your promotion means you need a positional change, renouncing the earth realms and taking on the fact that you really live in the palace. From there, you will affect the earth, but you don't switch it around. True promotion means you get your head on straight and you operate from that realm into the earth realm. And you practice this. You think about this. You think about how can I be heavenly on the earth? How can I be as though I live like royalty even though my checkbook says zero? Because it's by faith, right? See, true promotion means you take it on before you actually see it. Promotion by faith. And we live in that realm, and then we begin to see God do things. Now, the last thing I'm going to leave you with, and relative to this promotion, which is actually what happened this month of Adar when Esther got her second promotion, which didn't sound like it was as fun as the first one. first one was a lot, a lot more fun, I'm sure, than the second one. So the attitude that we are supposed to have in the midst of all this is the attitude that Christ Jesus had. He was a humble servant. He, all, he walked with, with so much love and so much peace, and, but he had an attitude of joy. Yes, your Savior had an attitude of joy. Okay? You did not fall in love with a savior, savior who is a curmudgeon. Our Jesus is not a curmudgeon. Okay? He laughs. He has fun. When he laughs, the glory of the Lord fills the room. He loves his people. He enjoys them. He wants to be with them all the time. They're the best thing in the world to him. And so as you're promoted, have the joy of the Lord with you. The joy of the Lord is contagious. The joy of the Lord is a strength that you'll carry that will cause every evil thing to break down right in a moment. As you laugh, Satan gets confused. Because his plan was that he was going to cause you to cry. But because you come into a situation and you laugh and you bring the joy of the Lord, every demon force cannot touch you because you are carrying with you the joy of who he is. That says you're truly promoted. When we're promoted, we bring gifts and blessings to people. How can you bring them something you don't have? But guess what? You have all of it. Every royal treasury belongs to you. Every vat of heaven is yours. Every tool that, that God has in heaven is available to you in the here and now, and you don't have to wait for it until you die. It's available now. See, as agents of change, as extensions of the king himself, he didn't leave us without the resources that we need to go and be the blessing to others. You are never without your resources. I never want to hear it come out of your mouth that you do not have the resources. You have the resources. Have you accessed them? That's the question. In our desperation, we'll say, I don't have enough of this. Bite your tongue and say, I surely do have enough of it. I got more than enough of it. I just got to figure out how I'm going to access the more than enough that I have right now because I'm living pretty earthly in this moment. Come on, just be real. I'm living pretty earthly, but I know I'm a citizen of heaven. Hey, how do I access that stuff? Then get in his word, and he'll lift you up, and he'll take you to that place where he says, my child, all of this belongs to you, all of it. See, we should never have fear. You cannot be afraid in the presence of the Lord because every need has been met. What fear do you have? Fear is generated from lack. If you have everything, you have no fear, right? So we live in this place, this place of promotion. This is your new attitude. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, I got me a new attitude.
You got a new attitude. Listen, you need this new attitude because the promotion that God's given you is pretty great. And your promotion is already being tested by the enemy. And he's going to continue to do this. Now, you're going to stand strong between now and Nisan, the first day that we, the calendar turns over, where we step into Passover. You'll stand strong. This is, your, this is your time where you're getting your grounding on your new foundation. You've been promoted. You're learning to live in the palace. It took Esther a year to figure this out. Okay? It takes a while. It takes a while. But the more we start living like this, the closer we are to seeing the return of our Savior. Why? Because he never comes for what he, what he hasn't already prepared his people to be living in before he gets there. See, king's not going to roll up and say, hey, I'm here. All you peasants, get yourself together. He's not going to do that. He's going to roll up expecting that his royal people are going to be cheering him on, ready and waiting and expecting for his arrival. He's, he's not rolling up to say, hey, don't you know I raised you up? He's not rolling up in his chariot to tell you and coach you on so that you can put it on to be right. He's not coming to coach you on. He already coached you on. That's what the word of God is. It's a has been. It's already happened. He's expect that we're all coached up. That we're all dressed and ready to go without wrinkle, spot, or blemish. That our crowns are adjusted properly. Whatever your deal is, you got on your best of the best because he's coming back and he's ready to have a party with people that can sit at the table with him. Not ones that he needs to feed with a baby spoon. But this means we got to put it on. This means you are no longer a citizen of this earth. You are a citizen of heaven. Reconcile this truth and renounce it. You will not have the power that God is asking you to walk in in 2021 with the boldness and the courage that it's going to take to be a Christian in the here and now if you do not know who you are. It will not cut it. it, it's, it all them days are past. You are now at a time where you will be challenged for your faith. You may even be put to death for believing in Jesus. If you do not prepare yourself now. Now, this is a word that I could have put out in China. They've already been dying there. Sri Lanka, the Muslim nations, they already die for their faith in Jesus. We don't have that issue here right now, but it may be quickly approaching. The sign of the time says... If you're already in royalty, then you will be able to stand. If you see yourself as a peasant, you may just shrink back. We ought to cross the line. If the band wants to come up, we got to cross the line. I'm going to do a faith activation. I want everybody to stand up in a line here. Just stand up in a line. Leave yourself some space. Stand back just to about there, where Debbie is, where Elder Debbie is. Stand back right there. Leave yourself some space at the front. Now, let me tell you what. This is really, really powerful because I sense the spirit. We've all committed ourselves to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. If anybody's here and you have not already done that, you can do that in this faith activation. But I know most of you. And you've already received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So this is an activation of your faith. And listen, I'm right there with you. I've already done this. I did this this past week. It was very, very powerful for my walk with God. Now, there's a line there. There's an imaginary line. And it's right at the tip of your toes all the way down there. That's the earth side the side that you're on. He already crossed. Whoa, you guys are free willing it. I didn't even have to say anything. I didn't even have to pray for you. Okay, now, that means you said you're ready to be a citizen of heaven. Like, that was easy activation. That was easy. So we can, we can praise him from this place. So you cross the line. Do you know what this means? 
That's right. You, you, you give him a hand clap. You give him a hand clap. Pastor Adam is the first one. He led the charge. Now, let me tell you, this is so important. Okay, you, you did it in the physical. You crossed the line. I want all you band members to cross the line. Wherever you're standing, I want you to take a big leap forward. If you're crossing the line into heaven, don't hit the keyboard there, brother. Okay? Okay, so what this means is that we have said, ooh, we have, we have denounced our earthly citizenship. Now, this is the activation. Because you denounced it, because you crossed the line. See, God already considered you to have denounced it, but you have habits and patterns and thoughts that are still clinging to the earth realms. That's where the error is going to be in the end. So when we cross the line, and we see we've crossed the line into the heavenly realms, what this means is we've said now, we've denounced our earthly citizenship. We're now a citizen of heaven. It says we now agree to live royally. You're all royal. Touch your neighbor and touch your neighbor and say you're royal. You're royal. You're royal. You're royal. You're royal. You're royal. Listen, royalty's not concerned about where it's going to get its next meal. Royalty is not concerned about half the stuff that us peasants worry about on a daily basis. Royalty doesn't care about that. Royalty knows every need's already been met. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, every need's been met. That's right. You give him a hand clap because he met the need. It was met when Jesus came to the earth. He died. He buried. He, re he resurrected and he ascended. But his shed blood says that the work is done and the power of sin is no more over your life. You're no longer a slave to sin. Guess what? The royals are not slaves to sin because they're a slave to nobody. If you're a royal, everyone's a slave to you. But you ain't a slave to anybody. Now, all y'all are royal. You are not slaves to anyone but the king who has redeemed you to be a love slave. And a love slave is one that he doesn't harm, that he blesses, that he calls to himself, that he encourages, that he gives all provision to, to go forth and make the difference. So as we stand together today in unity, we're all agreeing at this particular point that we're leaving our earthly citizenship behind. Now, let me tell you what. This, let me just give you an idea what this is going to look like. See, you're going to have some friends, and they're going to call you, and they're going to be all gossipy, and they're going to be saying, come over here and drink and do this, and let's go mess around, and let's do this and that. Okay, you have some people that are not heavenly citizens. They're earthly citizens. They're going to be the ones that are going to pull on you the most for this. Okay, so you get your head on straight. Your body is going to start crying out in different ways, saying, no, I'm just from the earth realms. Don't you know how bad I hurt? I, your pocketbook's going to cry out, look, look, it's just it's the earth realms. Look at this. I'm, I'm giving you all warnings about where the difference is between earth and heaven. No, you rebuke it, and you say, I'm from the heavenly realms. My body doesn't hurt. I have all I need. God has properly positioned me. I've been promoted, and I'm going to step in to all that God has called me to. That's the language of heavenly citizens. So if you're rebuking the earth and you're entering into heavenly citizenship, this means you've got to change your talk. Your talk has got to change. It's the word of God. So as promoted citizens of the kingdom of God, you have even been given his word to speak everything that the royals speak. So lift your hands right now. We're going to pray together. Father, I thank you in this place right now. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. Heavenly citizens. Heavenly citizens, Father. These are your heavenly citizens. They have renounced the earth realms. I thank you that in their minds right now, there's a shift that just took place. 
that when they see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, they will no longer see the earthly as being acceptable and something to love. They will only see the heavenly as being that way, and that will empower them to bring it to the earth, to bless the earth. I thank you right now the shift is taking place. Shift, 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 a shift in the mind, a shift in the heart right now. The soul is shifting away from earthly citizenship to heavenly citizenship. A death is taking place. I've died to the earth and have risen to the heaven. Glory. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for this shift right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, who's new? Who's new? Who's heavenly? Who's new? Who's heavenly? Yes. 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 He did it. He did it. It was was a supernatural activation. Now, you will not be the same. I know it. And I want to get a testimony. Even today, you all are going to be able to see the difference between the two of them. And you're going to go, whoa. I, I, I saw it this way, but now I see it this way. So, Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus for what you did in this house. And I thank you that you shifted our souls. You shifted our minds, Father. And I thank you that we're heavenly. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay.